this a boost to mommy? We're to tell the truth, the whole truth, not the truth of God. I don't. As she sits in court, schoolgirl Alyssa Bustamante is at the eye of a tragic storm. And as I'm walking into the church, I get a call from um, uh, Elizabeth's mother. And she's asking about her daughter. And I said, well, I've not seen her. I don't know anything about it. Hours pass, still no sign of Elizabeth. Elizabeth Alton is a sweet, shy nine-year-old girl. She's just all sweetness and light. She's the kind of child that you really like to be around. She's the kind of child that everyone adores. Good morning, Alyssa. Could you state your full name for the record? Alyssa Daly Bustamante. Who was this person that could have possibly abducted this girl? Was other children in the neighborhood, were they at risk? Did we have a predator on the loose in this small little town America? What made Alyssa Bustamante the teenage killer she became? Using expert digital imagery to show the different faces of an emerging killer, this series reveals the timelines and the red flags of those who will one day be investigated for murder. I think it was only a matter of time that Alyssa would graduate to homicide. And you can see this because she delighted in inflicting pain on other people. Alyssa Bustamante was born on January 28th, 1994, in Missouri. For grandmother Karen, it was love at first sight. Well, I was there when she was born, so I got to cut the cord when she was delivered. Her mother was just 16. She was the teeniest little baby, so sweet. But the tiny baby's first steps were into a troubled world. Alyssa Bustamante didn't exactly have a storybook childhood. She was born to a teenage mom who had drug problems, uh, and uh, her father, both mother and father, had criminal records. Her dad was actually in prison, serving a 10-year sentence for assault, and her mom just continued drug problems. So neither parent was ever really in the picture for Alyssa. Alyssa had two brothers and a younger half-sister called Emma. Theirs was not a happy family. Both parents were drug users. Forensic psychologist Dr. Judy Ho has been analyzing the timeline of the life of Alyssa Bustamante. When somebody grows up in a family with addiction issues and a lot of instability, they don't have a safe haven for themselves. They don't know who they are. They don't know what's safe and what's not. They haven't been taught boundaries and possibly not been provided positive models on how to interact with the rest of the world. Grandparents Karen and Gary tried to help out where they could, sending groceries and making regular visits. When she was eight, Alyssa's mother split with her father and moved to California to be nearer her parents. We soon discovered that her mother was a drug addict and what had been going on in Missouri was not good. The kids were not very well cared for. Uh, we tried to help Alyssa's mother care for the children, but she would get on drugs and, and go off and disappear or she'd do things she would, uh, she had a boyfriend that was a drug dealer. There was one particular night, my husband had called me to tell me that he went over to see the kids. We'd gotten them a little trailer so they could have, Michelle could have a little privacy. We were hoping that would help. Anyway, it was a disaster. And so uh, beer cans were all over and she was um, not, she was there, but she was, I think she was passed out on the bed. Her brothers were like feral children. They, they wouldn't sleep in beds. They were, they were very wild. They, they would, you know, punch the wall. At three years old, they would punch the wall and make holes in the wall. Three-year-olds, if you can imagine that. And, and other things like that that showed that they had had no, no boundaries and had not had any care in their upbringing up to that time. Brother Nathaniel has fonder memories of his and Alyssa's early years. I remember we used to have a tree house in our old uh, place in California, and it used to have like a rope and a ladder, but she, she would take the rope up, or the ladder up sometimes and wouldn't let us climb and, and get up there until we could 
you know, make it up the rope ourselves. But other than that, like she, she seemed like a pretty good sister. Like she, you know, tried to show us the way with some things and help us out. And you know, I never really, you know, thought anything bad of her. We had about a year when things were, we, I, we were trying to hope that the parents were gonna get this together and raise their children. And when we realized it wasn't gonna happen, Drugs had taken the parents away from Alyssa Bustamante and her brothers. When somebody grows up in a family with addiction issues and a lot of instability, they don't have a safe haven for themselves. They don't know who they are. They don't know what's safe and what's not. They haven't been taught boundaries and possibly not been provided positive models on how to interact with the rest of the world. In 2001, the loving grandparents knew it was time for an intervention. The uh, sheriff's department there advised us to get custody of the children, and, we, and that's when we did. And that was uh, right about the time Alyssa turned eight, and her brothers were still three. I really didn't want to take these children away from their parents, but we did. We had to. But I remember we were homeschooled for a few months, and that actually that made our family life pretty pretty rough because just me and my brother like you know, being together 24 seven doing school exactly together really kind of led us to get in more fights with each other. And like, we were kind of, you know, sick of each other at that point. And then, so our grandma decided to put us back into school, which was, I think was a really good outlet for both of us. She wanted to keep us away from the hostile environment that it could have created at school. Gary and Karen found it tough, but tried hard to become de facto parents to Alyssa, her two brothers and her half sister. It was Alyssa who proved toughest. We would be out like at a, a store and she would just um, go down on the ground. Now, bear in mind, she was eight years old at this time. And she would act out things like, like a four-year-old would do, like she was a giraffe or a donkey or whatever. Or she would chase in and out of the clothes at the store. And of course, people that are around at that time are looking at me like, aren't you gonna do something about this? She would never talk about what was, I guess, what you call her core issues because we know that she had experienced some bad things before she was seven, before we got her, and that um, she would never talk about it. In fact, uh, because of that background, she thought all adults were her enemy and therefore couldn't be confided in. On the one hand, being rescued by other family members might feel very good, but on the other hand, there could be feelings of abandonment, that somehow your parents don't actually really truly care about you, and that's why you were sent to live with your grandparents. And there's gonna be a lot of rebelling involved, you know, not understanding exactly why you're in the situation that you are now and why you've been taken away from your parents. And children are very much focused on the reasons for why bad things happen to them. And as children, they're very self-centered in that they always believe that they're the reason. And so it's very possible that Alyssa basically bought into her own narrative that, well, I'm basically already a bad child anyway, and I might as well behave like I'm a bad person. Karen took Alyssa's bad behavior badly. She began having panic attacks. So the couple decided to move the family from California to St. Martin's, Missouri and to work a low-level farm caring for horses, an easier life, perhaps. Soon after, Elizabeth's estranged mother visited the farm. That didn't help. I think it was just the, the abandonment hitting her one more time. She really thought this time her mother was gonna get it together, and she abandoned her one more time. She was in her bedroom in bed, and she had the covers over her head, and I could hear her crying. Went in, and I lowered the covers, and we cried together. And um, for Alyssa, it's her mother, and she loves her, and she's left her again. And I think that in her mind, she was, it was hopeless that she wasn't gonna come back, she wasn't gonna get her life together, and she finally had to face that. Her mother wasn't coming back. And um, I guess she decided that it was more than she could handle. Shortly after, Alyssa attempted suicide with an overdose of the painkiller Tylenol. Well, we called the... We called the paramedics, they came, and um, in this particular case, she was a very fortunate girl. They were able to give her the medicine to counter any major organ damage, which is what happens with Tylenol. That's why they don't usually make it, especially when she took the whole bottle. Despite her age at just 12, 
it was felt Alyssa needed pharmaceutical help. And that's when we started our time with the uh, counselors here. And that's when they first started putting her on Prozac. She went on 20 milligrams at that time when she was 12, in between 12 and 13. She would became very depressed. She would be so depressed that she didn't want to get out of bed. And the fact that she had to go to school was something that's like not worth getting out of bed for. But then she would have other times when she was, she was very alert and active and so on. And once we tried to get help for her, she was diagnosed as being uh, bipolar. And that's sort of explained her behavior in a lot of ways that uh, she was down and up and, and so on. After a suicide attempt, I was hospitalized and put on medication and was in, in intensive outpatient care with pathways. Prozac is one of the most commonly utilized medications, even for teenagers. And generally it's used very effectively and very safely, although there have been black box warnings about Prozac in the past that it might provoke suicidal ideation in people who are already depressed. But very, very rarely do we ever hear that Prozac could actually instigate violent, degrading behavior. And that in combination with the fact that Alyssa clearly had these roots in her behavior at a much younger age before she was even on medication makes me doubt that Prozac is what's to blame here. Karen also discovered that around this time, Alyssa had started self-harming. She probably had 100 cuts on each arm, just with a knife and hundreds and hundreds of cuts. And then she had carved in her arm pain and hate because sometimes pain was the only thing that helped her to break through her emotional walls that she has. The disaster that would visit Alyssa's new hometown of St. Martin's began on October 21st, 2009. A neighbor calls Karen. Her nine-year-old daughter, Elizabeth Olton, hasn't come home. I'm walking into the church. I get a call from um, uh, Elizabeth's mother and she's asking about her daughter. And I said, well, I've not seen her. I don't know anything about it. And she said, well, she was, you know, she was with Alyssa and now I can't find her and it's dark and she never out at night. Where was Elizabeth Olton? And what part in her disappearance had Alyssa Bustamante played? Late afternoon, October 19th, 2009. While Alyssa Bustamante is apparently at school, Elizabeth heads home. She calls at the home of Emma, Alyssa's half-sister, and the two girls go out to play. Elizabeth Alton is a sweet, shy, nine-year-old girl. She's just all sweetness and light. She's, she loves kitty cats and the color pink. She's a girly girl. She's the kind of child that you really like to be around. She's the kind of child that everyone adores. And as far as anyone knew, she was out there in the woods playing when dinner time came. Her mother's getting dinner on the table. It's, it's time for everyone to have supper together. And Elizabeth's not there. And they're, Elizabeth, where are you? Are you home? And there's no answer. She doesn't know where the little girl is. And she knows that it's dark outside, so it's weird that she's not home. Police are alerted and immediately start a search. Word soon spreads through the tiny town of St. Martin's about Elizabeth's disappearance. You have a community that came together. Well, it's a town a little bit over a thousand people. You literally had hundreds of people that volunteered for this search. They spread out, they searched woods. It was cold, it was damp. Uh, they were worried about the temperatures. Now, St. Martin's is a little town of about a thousand people. It's the kind of town that pretty much everybody knows everybody. So to have a little girl vanish and no one has seen her, it's really bizarre. But it's the kind of thing that gets people's attention. As the search widens, officers start to fear the worst. Was this little girl lost? Who was this person that could have possibly abducted this girl? Was other children in the neighborhood, were they at risk? Did we have a predator on the loose in this small little town America? Police soon decide that the predator may have been someone close to home 
and not fitting the usual profile of a child snatcher. Investigations 101 would tell you that you have to take a victim and recreate sometimes as much as the 24 hours preceding their abduction or when they're missing. What's going on? Who do they know? Who, who are their friends? And this is what happened in this investigation. When they started from the point who last saw little Elizabeth alive or who was last known to be with her, the name Alyssa Bustamante came up. Somehow, Alyssa was able to talk Elizabeth into going into the woods with her. I mean, she trusted her. She was uh, her friend's big sister and she'd known her for a long time. So she goes into the woods with Alyssa. The Alton family lived just a few doors from Alyssa. Alyssa spent a lot of time in the woods near both homes. She got to know them well. I guess you'd call her a tomboy. She liked, she liked playing outside. She liked climbing trees. And we had quite a few trees around and she climbed them all. She enjoyed the snow when it snowed here and, and so on that uh, she didn't get in California, but she was outside in the winter as well as in the summer here. Uh, she liked to go out in the woods and explore and, and do all kinds of things. Knowing that Elizabeth had been with Alyssa's sister, Elizabeth's brother and mother call at the Bustamante house, asking if they knew anything about Elizabeth's movements. Why are you asking us? And I said, well, because she left and was with Alyssa. And I was like, whoa, we didn't know that. So we asked Alyssa and uh, Alyssa kind of brushed it off and said, well, yeah, she was, but then she left and went home. Of course, she thought she went home. and. Um, Alyssa was going to a church function at that time. So Karen took Alyssa to the church function and Elizabeth Olton's mother then got concerned and was asking us, you know, what happened to Elizabeth. There's panic between, you know, mom and brother for sure. And like for even us who were like, you know, what could have happened to her? Like, why wouldn't she be home by now? Officers talked to Alyssa's half sister, Emma. So they had to have a special person come to talk to her, a child counselor to find out what happened. And then that's when we found out that, that Emma did go over there and knocked on the door and asked if Elizabeth could come out and play. And so we found that out Wednesday night. And, um, but Emma said that they, they went out, they played. She said they stayed here on the property and they played on the road. A couple hours later, about 7.30, 8 o'clock, the sheriff was here and started looking around for Elizabeth and started asking questions of our family. We tried to help as best we could because we still were wondering what the heck is going on here. We, we never saw her. Lunchtime the next day and Elizabeth was still missing. Officers decide to do what is known as a ping search for Elizabeth's mobile phone, where data is collected and used to zero in on the location of the phone. The search shows that Elizabeth's mobile is somewhere in the 60 acres of woodland near her house. It was the signal. As long as that cell phone was on, it was like a tracking device, much like the old childhood tales of Hansel and Gretel leaving a trail. Was this her little trail? And so the search teams were able to gather, and they st started on a starting point. Where was this signal coming from? And so very judiciously, Piece by piece, acre by acre, they searched the woods, they searched the fields following this signal. But you see, that signal's only good as long as that phone is on. And they ran out of time. The battery died. Then data comes back about Elizabeth's phone calls. Officers discover that she had had an unexpected call on the way home from Melissa Bustamante. Elizabeth could not know the danger that she was in from a troubled teenager whose short life had made her ready for murder. So Elizabeth Leafs is on her way home when her cell phone rings. She looks and she sees, it's Alyssa calling me. Why is Alyssa calling me? Why is this older sister calling me? And she's you know, kind of a little flattered by that. And so she takes the phone call and Aly Alyssa is asking Elizabeth to come back to the house. And we don't know what she tells her to get her to go back because it is time for Elizabeth to go home. But she does, Elizabeth goes back. Elizabeth is nine, Alyssa's a teenager. 
paying a nine-year-old girl attention. Elizabeth wants to please Alyssa, and all Alyssa has to do is call her over. And so Elizabeth goes with Alyssa. Elizabeth completely trusts Alyssa. Officers discover from her family that Alyssa hadn't made it to school that day. Called the woman that she drove, that drives her to school, and she said, well, yeah, I dropped her off at the school. Well, she never got to the school. And so I went up to the school, we couldn't find her, and then um, I guess a little bit later, she got on the home bus, got on the bus and came home. But what she was doing instead of school was macabre. You get a day off, what are you gonna do? Most kids probably hang out with your friends, go to the movies, maybe hang out at the mall. Not Alyssa. Instead, Alyssa takes a shovel and she goes into the woods near her home and she digs and she digs and she digs. She digs two holes in the ground shaped like graves. Who does this? <laughs> Officers decide to search Alyssa's bedroom. They were focusing upstairs on Alyssa's room. And I mean, looking back, I don't know why I, I didn't catch something, but we really didn't. I, I just, I didn't, didn't catch a thing. But they were taking pictures and that's probably when they found her uh, diary, but they didn't say anything. They take Alyssa's diary away to be further examined. They also start to look at Alyssa's social media accounts. Alyssa was really active online. She spent a lot of time posting. Her Facebook page, you'd see pictures of her selfies um, with her lipstick, red lipstick, just smeared across her face to make it look like blood. Um, dramatic black kabuki style makeup. Then she would grit her teeth and try to look scary, or she'd pout and try to look, you know, vampy, you know, like some kind of a sex pot. She really liked to be noticed, and she wanted to be different, and she really prided herself in this, this bad girl image that she had. But probably the most disturbing stuff she had online. On her YouTube account, she had listed her hobbies as killing people and cutting. One video in particular causes serious concern. In one case, she's posted a video where she's trying to lure her little brothers to touch this electric fence and, and get shocked. She actually does it herself to lure them, so she goes up to it and she touches the fence and she feels the pain of the shock. And she's trying to get her little brothers to do that. And underneath you hear, you see the words that she's written. She says, this is the fun part. I'm about to hurt my little brothers. This is not just the kind of a thing where you're teasing your little brothers. She's actually j taking joy and in inflicting pain on these little kids. I think it was only a matter of time that Alyssa would graduate to homicide. And you can see this because she delighted in inflicting pain on other people. The significance of the video was lost on the young Nathaniel. I knew about the, the electric fence video, but I, didn't, I, I guess as a kid, we didn't really think you know anything about, because we didn't know anything about like YouTube or much then. And so I, didn't, I guess we just never realized that she posted that. Nathaniel believes he and his brother were playing along and gave as good as they got. But homicide detective Brian Harris doesn't see the clip that way. A very smart, intelligent, young lady, but at the same time with a very dark side who enjoys inflicting pain, who relishes and posted online how she enjoyed seeing her two little brothers being electrified. She tricked them into touching an electrical fence and she found pleasure and joy out of that. So the personality of a very dark soul starts to emerge and the focus of the investigation zeroes in on none other than Alyssa Bustamante. The preschool Alyssa had been part of a dysfunctional family. By just nine years old, her father was in prison. Her mother passed out drunk on a regular basis, where the ingredients in place to make Alyssa Bustamante into a killer. With the phone call established from Alyssa to Elizabeth, sightings of the two together, and her absence from school that day, Alyssa is now officially a person of interest to the investigation. Detectives ask Alyssa and her grandparents in for an interview. At that point, I was still 100% sure that Alyssa had nothing to do with anything. I mean, if somebody had asked me, it was 100% sure I knew that she was not involved in that. 
Alyssa and I went in and we were being questioned by the sergeant as well as they had a um, juvenile officer there uh, that, that was asking questions about the incident, about what she was doing, where did you go, and what happened, and, 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 I, and I, for about the first 20 minutes, I still was in the dark. And so finally, he started asking her more pointed questions and pretty much um, putting things. I remember thinking, wow, why is he, why is he saying this stuff? And um, he made a comment about how, I know you did this because you wanted to do this, and I know you wanted to know what it felt like. The officer produces the diary that was confiscated from Melissa's room. Told her that they had found her diary in which she mentions uh, what she had done. Detectives confront Alyssa Bustamante with pages which show hastily scored out lines, but two words can be seen, slit and throat. The day after she kills Elizabeth, she's writing in her journal and she writes, I just effing killed someone. I slit their throat, stabbed them, and watched them die. Oh my gosh, if it made me so nervous at first, but once you get over that, oh my God, I can't believe I'm doing this, it actually becomes really enjoyable. I can't believe it, it was amazing. Okay, gotta go to church now, LOL. <laughs> That's what she wrote. Alyssa Bustamante began to reveal the truth. It had been an accident, she told detectives. Elizabeth had fallen in the woods and banged her head. We will find the body, one tells her. Will we find her throat has been cut? Yes, says Elisa. Her grandmother all but collapsed. That's when I realized, oh my gosh, oh my gosh. And I just had a breakdown right there in the middle of this whole situation. And I turned just to get out. I, I, I just, I couldn't breathe. I couldn't focus. I couldn't. Function. And what should have happened is it should have stopped right there when I, because I had to leave. I was not cognitive at that point, but it didn't stop. They let me out and they continued to um, talk to her, interrogate her, whatever word you want to use. Alyssa agreed to take officers into the woods where she had been on the day of the disappearance, digging two grave sized holes. Buried in one of the makeshift graves, officers find the body of nine-year-old Elizabeth Alton. Detectives then get the complete picture of what Alyssa had done. She brings Elizabeth to an isolated area. God only knows what was going through Elizabeth's mind at first, but then suddenly a hit, a punch, a slap, punch after punch. Basically, Alyssa delighted in playing God. And you can understand this when you know more about the method of killing that she chose. Elizabeth, she must have screamed out. Now she's making noise. She chose extremely close up, messy methods. Again, very atypical for a female and even more atypical for a young female like Alyssa was because she was just a teenager. How do you stop somebody from screaming after being beat? and beat, you choke them. The most personal way somebody can kill somebody is by strangulation. It's up close, it's personal. And the fact that she didn't do it at a distance, she didn't use poison, the types of things that we know female murderers to use, but in fact, she used a knife and then she strangled them on top of using the knife. And you're squeezing the life out of somebody and her hands are around little Elizabeth's neck. And Elizabeth, I can only imagine, is fighting, fighting for her life. And then not only does Alyssa strangle Elizabeth, it's not good enough for her. She wants to see and step back and take a look at her work. And she takes out a knife and slashes poor Elizabeth's body. And then to make sure that the job is complete on this lifeless body, she takes the knife and slices her from ear to ear. That is indicative that Alyssa was probably going to graduate to this point at some point during her life. She then went home, wrote up her crime in the diary, and referred to the fact that she was now headed for church. 
Alyssa is somebody that is very good at compartmentalization. On the one hand, she can play the role of a good girl going to church and follow general rules of the household so that she didn't get kicked out by her grandparents who definitely seemed like they were trying to instill good values in her. But on the other hand, she had this whole other side. Not that she was trying to hide that side even, it's just the idea that somebody like Alyssa it didn't really feel like cognitive dissonance for her. For another human being that doesn't have the ideas and mindset of Alyssa, this would greatly disturb them to be, you know, this horrible person who is violent on the one hand and then going to church and singing in the choir, for example, uh, on the other. But for Alyssa, it didn't really bother her. And that shows us that she is not somebody who really has a strong sense of identity. Alyssa Bustamante is charged with the murder of Elizabeth Olton. Despite her confession, Elisa enters a plea of not guilty. How do you plead not guilty when you have just told police you killed this little girl and then you've actually brought them to the grave where you've dumped her body? The stress of being in custody causes Elisa to fall into self-destructive habits. As she's being held in jail awaiting her trial, she starts her old tricks again. She starts cutting. She doesn't have any real tools to do it with, but she uses her fingernails and she starts to harm herself by cutting. And she's showing clear signs of anxiety and severe depression. What more would Alyssa Bustamante tell officers about the death of Elizabeth Olton? And what might the self-harmer do? Did you continue or did you have any suicidal thoughts after your arrest? Yes. Alyssa Bustamante is put on suicide watch and given emergency psychiatric help. There were still ways Alyssa could avoid a life sentence for the murder of Elizabeth Holton. 15 at the time of the offense, Alyssa was still legally a minor. Despite that, her judge decided to hear her case as an adult. So there's already been a judge that has declared that Alyssa Bustamante, although 15, very well knew the consequences of her actions and therefore she was tried as an adult. It was time to put the case of the death of nine-year-old Elizabeth Alton to the people of Missouri. They had to decide if Elisa Bustamante was mad or bad, ruined by a terrible life or simply made for murder. She took the decision from their hands. So much evidence against Alyssa and she's pled not guilty. But the night before the trial, she changes her mind. And she enters a plea of guilty. And in an open court, it's the first time that Alyssa has ever showed any emotion. And she weeps and she cries. Why does she plead guilty? Because she gets a reduced sentence. Her charge now goes from first degree murder to second degree murder. So is Alyssa pleading guilty because she wants to take responsibility for it? Or is Alyssa pleading guilty because it's about Alyssa? She doesn't, she's, she's pleading guilty because she doesn't want to go to prison for the rest of her life. And if maybe if she can get a reduced charge, she won't have to. It's always all about Alyssa. It's never about Elizabeth. Alyssa's hearing began on January 30th, 2012. She pleaded guilty to second degree murder and armed criminal action. As part of a plea deal, she had to describe to the court just what she had done to Elizabeth. The courtroom is packed with people. Everyone has been watching this case. And they know what Alyssa has been charged with. They know what she did. But this is the first time they're going to hear Alyssa actually say out loud what it is that she did. And as she starts talking about what she did, how she lures this sweet little girl into the woods, how she beats her brutally, and how she slices her throat, there's like a gasp over the courtroom. It is literally breathtaking. They cannot believe this 15-year-old girl, what she is saying she did, it's coming to life in their eyes. Just the horror of it all. And Alyssa is as calm as a cucumber. The reaction in the courtroom is pure shock and silence until one lone voice is heard. And that voice in anger and frustration out of this plea deal cries out, 
and declares that Alyssa Bustamante should spend as much time in prison as Elizabeth has to for eternity. Alyssa's defense began by focusing on her troubled background. If I'm a defense attorney, having to defend somebody like Alyssa Bustamante, clearly, easily, I'm gonna focus in on her childhood. Her dad's been in prison. Her mom was addicted to drugs. She lived with her grandparents. Her grandparents clearly incapable of raising this emotionally disturbed child. I would really focus in on Alyssa's mental capabilities. The defense case was simple. How could a child for whom no one took responsibility in her early years be held responsible for murder? When you look at children who've grown up with parents who are criminals themselves, and in fact, maybe the values of criminality have been rewarded in this family system, it's no wonder that Alyssa would grow up to basically start to dabble more and more in crimes as she became a child, a teenager, and, and so forth. And the reason is you haven't been given a template for acting any different. And children soak up knowledge like no other in their early years, because that's when you're really learning about the world and how it works. And seeing two parents who have been involved in crime makes you feel like maybe that's just the way the world works and that it is a natural path for you as well. They talk about how she's just severely depressed and psychologically damaged. She has borderline personality disorder, which is usually characterized by lack of impulse control for anger and, and outbursts and dark depression. This is a really disturbed little girl. This wasn't Alyssa who did this. This was, Alyssa never would have done this if she had been in her right mind. The challenge for a defense attorney, if they're gonna claim that their client is insane, is to show that at the time of the offense, their client did not know that what they were doing was wrong. Well, that gets totally blown up by the discovery by the detectives when they discover Alyssa's own journal. And it's her own words that totally destroys that defense. Because in her journal, she describes very nonchalantly how she killed somebody, how she strangled them, how she beat them, and ultimately slit their throat. One of those tasked with finding the body of Elizabeth spoke candidly to the jury. This Missouri State Highway Patrolman summed it up pretty simply. He said she did it for the thrill. She did it because she wanted to know what it felt like to kill someone. Before being sentenced, Alyssa read a prepared statement to the court. I know words can never be enough and they can never adequately describe how horribly I feel for all of this. If I could give my life to get her back, I would. I'm sorry, she said. The only time Alyssa showed any kind of emotion is after she got up and professed what a horrible thing she did. She sits down and her own grandparents, the two constants in her life, the two people who tried to be the anchors for her and give her some kind of stability, get up from the courtroom and they leave. It's at that moment that Alyssa realizes she is truly alone. Now, she starts tearing, she starts to cry. We'll never know, were those tears for Elizabeth or were they tears for herself? Alyssa Bustamante was sentenced in 2009 to 30 years in prison for the murder charge without a chance of parole and a further 30 years for armed criminal action. In all, 60 years behind bars. Just a few weeks after Alyssa Bustamante's conviction, the US Supreme Court ruled that juveniles cannot face automatic life sentences without the possibility of parole. In 2015, Alyssa launched an appeal against her sentence. The now 20-year-old Alyssa claimed that she wouldn't have accepted her plea deal had she known that the High Court would remove mandatory sentences for juveniles with a murder conviction. Did they talk with you about the sentence you were subject to for first-degree murder? Yes. And what was that? Life without parole. Did you understand that that was the only sentence you could get on first-degree murder? Yes. 
basically the main reason for accepting the offer was to avoid the absolute certainty of life without parole. If there was another option, then there would have been no reason to have accepted that offer. Alyssa's appeal failed. In emails from her cell sent to this program, Alyssa Bustamante has spoken of her need to have hope that one day she might be released from prison. Otherwise, she told us she would kill herself. Alyssa's grandparents still drive the 70 miles every month to visit the now 25-year-old Alyssa in prison. But every day, they continue to struggle to understand the terrible crime she committed. Had her torrid upbringing created a teenager so troubled that she was made for murder? We're coming up on our 10 years, our 10-year anniversary, if you will. Uh, it took me almost five, really, to put my life back together. It was very tough, very difficult for all of us. Uh, because I, I just never, ever in my wildest dreams imagined that Alyssa would, be, would have um, the capability to do what she did that night. Never, never in my wildest dreams. So I know that, you know, on the outside, people definitely see her as, you know, a villain. And, like, you kind of, like, see her like that a little bit on the inside of the family. But she's still family. And, you know, with the things that happened to her and stuff, it's hard to put, you know, all the blame on her and not, you know, other circumstances. Like, at the core, you know, she's not, not bad. It's just circumstances made her do something bad. Not a position taken by some of those familiar with his case. Dr. Judy Ho thinks Alyssa is one of those killers whose murderous work never ends. They get such a rush of adrenaline from their first kill that the next time they have to make it even more bloody and even more violent so they can have that same sense of power and dominance again. So if Alyssa wasn't caught, she would have very much likely killed again and in even more horrific ways. And it was probably just a matter of time before she killed her own brothers, which many believe those two graves were actually originally designed for. With Alyssa and murder, she had her first taste of blood, true blood. No doubt in my mind, she would have wanted it again and then again. And think of new and different ways to inflict pain onto people. The seeds had been sown in the formative years of a girl whose father was in prison and whose mother had become addicted to drugs. Alyssa Bustamante had found some dark places, which meant she was made for murder.